So one thing I know for certain in this world is that Southern heat will cause you to make some of the worst decisions of your life. <laughs> and the particular situation I have in mind was a couple of years ago, uh, my family and I were at Disney World in Orlando and the particular terrible decision was ducking into a gift shop to get out of the heat, right? Now, I don't know about you, but I tend to avoid gift shops at all costs. I think they're designed solely for the purpose of grabbing me by the ankles and shaking me upside down to see what's left in my pockets. But on this day, it was hot. My family wanted to, to go in to get out of the heat. So we walk into the gift shop and I'm basking in my personal igloo under an air conditioning duct. And I look up and I happen to see what I have since come to refer to as the perfect t-shirt. So I'm going to show it to you, and I'm going to describe to you why I think this is, in fact, the perfect t-shirt. It's called How to Draw Darth Vader, all right? So the first panel says, start with a head and body. So far, so good. Second panel, add a cape. Again, so far, so good. Even I could do this. Third panel, draw the face, gloves, and boots. All right. Fourth panel, add details and some shading. Finished. <laughs> I think I laughed so hard I snorted when I saw this. I think this is a perfect t-shirt for a couple of reasons. First of all, come on, it's just funny, right? It's just funny. But second of all, I think this is often how we talk about the creative process, isn't it? We talk about things like, let's have, a, especially people in our organizations, let's have a vision. Let's determine the problem we're solving. Let's get the right people in the room. And voila, brilliant work pops out the other side. <laughs> Who knew it was so easy to do brilliant creative work? But those of us in the trenches, friends, we all know that the brilliant work all happens between panels three and four. Yes. And, and it's the result of a lot of really talented, driven, dedicated people doing whatever is necessary to make it happen. And that's admirable. But especially when we're commercializing our art, there are any number of pitfalls that we can encounter in between panels three and four. And we have to be very careful to be aware of those pitfalls or we can easily disqualify our body of work. I've spent the last 20 years of my life leading creative teams and studying creativity and innovation, but a very specific kind of creativity, creativity among those who have to go to work, who have to solve problems every day. How many of you solve problems as a function of your job? How many of you solve other people's problems every day? All right, one final question. How many of you had a specific person in mind when I asked that last question? Yeah. <laughs> it's what we do. We solve problems. But again, with that comes all of these pitfalls and pressures. I was reminded of a story of a young musician as I was thinking about what I wanted to share with you. July of 1967, this musician was presented with the opportunity of a lifetime. It was the chance to tour as the opening act for one of the most popular bands of the day. I mean, this band wasn't just popular. They were drawing thousands of people to arenas all over the country. So for a young relatively unknown musician, this is quite the opportunity. So of course, he said yes. The night came for the first show, the arena fills, the lights go down, and he walks out on stage and he begins to play. And the crowd goes silent for about three songs. And then after the third song, they began to liven up, but it wasn't quite the response he was hoping for. Instead of cheers, it was boos. Boos is in booing, not as in, that would have been more fun, not that kind of booze. <laughs> But like a pro, he finished the set, put down his guitar, walked off stage, completely distraught. Could you imagine how this would feel to be booed off stage? This is my big moment. And I got booed off stage in front of thousands of people. But the people around him said, listen, it's one city, it's one night. It's going to be totally different in the next city. And it was, in fact, different in the next city. Because in the following city, the boos began from the very first note and continued throughout the set. And this went on the third night and the fourth night and the fifth night and the sixth night and the seventh night until finally the eighth night of the tour, July 17th, 1967. Apparently word had traveled from city to city. And before the first note was even played, the booze began and continued throughout the set. And by this point, he'd had enough. I think any of us would have had enough by this point. As legend has it, he put down his guitar, may or may not have waved a profane gesture at the audience and turned around and walked off stage and quit the tour, never again to open for this massively popular band. Can you imagine how that would feel? Now, if you're present that night, you might've thought you were witnessing one of the greatest failures in music history. It doesn't get worse than being booed off stage by thousands of people. But I would submit to you, you were witnessing something slightly different. If you were present, 
on July 17th, 1967, when a young Jimi Hendrix took the stage to open for a band called The Monkees. I would submit to you, you were witnessing a very natural phenomenon. You were witnessing what happens when a new idea, a dangerous idea, an idea with rough edges is introduced into a marketplace that craves conformity. You see, we say that we want innovation. We say that we want new ideas. But the reality is the moment that we introduce something new, something dangerous, the response of our organization and of culture is taboo. Monkeys fans had no grid, no grid for what Jimmy Hendrix, is he playing with his teeth? What is he doing? That's weird. What is he doing? They had no grid. The monkeys represented the height of pop music bland popularity. They did. It's fine. I mean, there's nothing wrong with it, but there was nothing new, nothing innovative. But we all know how this story goes. How many of you have ever been to a party and heard, woo, play me some monkeys, right? <laughs> <laughs> I got to remember that one. Yeah. <laughs> but Jimi Hendrix went on to transform generations of those who followed because he refused in the face of resistance to monkey eyes his Hendrix music. Do you have that same courage, friends? There are a couple of forces we have to fight if we want to do this well. The first one is comfort. Comfort. Early in our career as a create on demand professional, we often hook into the most valuable and precious narcotic known to creative pros external validation. Somebody says, You're really good at that. And they begin to feed us. Ah, oh, that's the good stuff, right? And we lock and we load and we ride it out. And eventually we wake up one day and we say, I am nowhere near where I intended to be. See, the thing I've had to learn the hard way, and I know many pros that I work with have had to learn the hard way as well, is you can easily succeed your way into failure. You can accomplish a lot. You can accomplish external validation. People can praise you for what you do. You can look like you're on top of the world, and deep down you know I am very far from the person I intended to be. Let me illustrate this by uttering the most terrifying words ever uttered by a human being. Let me show you a card trick I just learned. Sorry, Harris. All right, I'm going to put five cards up on the screen. I want everyone to choose one card, just one card. I'm going to mind meld with you. All right, everybody have your card? All right, I'm going to remove the cards. Now, I, I know you people. Listen, you are my people, right? You are my people. So I think I can predict with great certainty the card that most of you chose. So I'm going to put four of those cards back up on the screen. I'm going to remove one of them, put four back up on the screen. How many people see your card? Nobody? Four people? Greatest trick ever. Thank you, story. Have a great day. Actually, these are four entirely different cards than the ones I put up the first time. <laughs> Those of you who raise your hand, come see me after. I have people I can refer you to. It's no problem. It's fine, right? <laughs> Why does this trick work? It works because I gave you a problem to solve and you performed brilliantly with a few exceptions. You performed brilliantly. You did. But in so doing, you ignored the context. You forgot what it is you're even trying to do. Friends, you can succeed your way to failure. What are you trying to do? And are you doing it? Don't monkey eyes your Hendrix music. The second dynamic we have to be aware of is fear. Is fear. Fear is the thief of dreams. And the sinister thing about fear is it often comes disguised as wisdom. It often sounds like, are you sure you want to? Wouldn't it be better if you, maybe you should wait until thief, Fear is the thief of dreams. There's a guy named Neil Fury who does research into procrastination. And he often brings people into a room like this. And he'll put a wood plank on the floor, 10 feet long, 6 inches wide. And he'll ask people, could you walk the length of this plank if I ask you to? I'll say, well, of course, it's a wood plank on the floor. I'd have to be drunk not to be able to do that. Great. Now imagine I take that plank and suspend it 100 feet in the air between two buildings. Now could you walk the length of that plank? And they look at the imaginary plank and they look at him and say, no way, are you kidding? I'd have to be drunk. No way am I walking a wood plank 100 feet in the air. 
Well, what's changed about the technical skill required to walk the plank? Absolutely nothing. If you can do it on the ground, you can do it in the air. What's changed are the perceived consequences of failure, which in this case is plummeting to your death, so I kind of get it, right? (laughs) But listen, I would submit to you that many of us go through our days artificially escalating planks, artificially escalating the perceived consequences of failure to the point that we don't act, to the point that, and this is, listen, this is important, to the point that we don't ask dangerous questions. We don't ask dangerous questions because we're afraid of the answers we might get. And when we get those answers, we know it's going to create accountability to act. And so we'd rather just shrink back and listen to the voice of fear. Fear is a thief. But as my friend Brian says, fear is also often the smell of opportunity. The place you're most afraid to go as a team, as an individual, when you're commercializing your work, It's also the place that you know you need to go. So how do we begin to countermand these dynamics of comfort and fear? I believe that the way that we do this is by identifying our productive passion. Productive passion. Now, the word passion is used, I think, out of context a lot. We talk about it as something we like, something we're interested in, something that gives us a thrill, like I'm passionate about ice cream, right? I find it helpful, which I am, by the way, very passionate about ice cream, but I find it very helpful to reclaim the original meaning of the word passion. The word passion in its root form comes from the word pati, which means to suffer. When we say we're passionate about something, it means I am willing to suffer if necessary to see it happen because I care more about the outcome than I do about my temporary comfort. I care more about the outcome than I do about whatever fear is whispering in my ear right now. I care more about that than I do about this. Productive passion must be your compass if you want to avoid the lure of comfort and fear and you want to refuse to monkey eyes your Hendrix music. Another way to say this is we need to identify the place where we say, here I stand. Here I stand. And never shall anyone cross this line. Over my dead body, am I going to compromise these principles? I'll change my mind. I'll do what's necessary to succeed. It's fine. But over my dead body, will I change these principles? So I want to give you a couple of questions you can ask in sort of a practical sense to be able to identify your productive passion. I call these the notables. They're questions we can ask to begin to look for patterns in our life to identify that productive passion for us. And by the way, I've walked teams through this as well. It can be very, very valuable in making decisions. The first one is, what angers you? Now, I'm not talking about road rage, right? Like, somebody cut me off on 65, you know? I'm talking about compassionate anger. Compassion means to suffer with. What makes you feel compassionate anger? Somebody needs to do something about that. Yeah, that somebody is you. What fills you with compassionate anger? And what are the patterns there that point to your best work, to the body of work you can be proud of? The second question you can ask is what makes you cry? Or guys, what makes you feel like you got something in your eye, right? Because guys don't really admit that they cry. So I am um, uh, a huge fan of this movie, Rudy. Do you guys know the movie Rudy? Rudy, 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 right? Okay, for those of you who haven't seen it, I'm about to totally spoil it for you. But Rudy is about this, um, this little tiny guy that wants to play football for Notre Dame. True story. Can't make the team, can't make the team. After all of this effort, he finally makes the team. It's the climactic moment. He gets in the final game of the year. He gets in, he makes this amazing play. Everybody's cheering for him. I'm watching this movie. My wife comes downstairs. I've got lots of stuff in my eye, right? She's like, why are you crying? You've seen this movie a hundred times. Why are you crying? I'm like, I know, but he's so tiny and he plays so well. It's beautiful, (laughs) it's beautiful, (laughs) right? I am profoundly moved by the stories of underdogs. I am Some of my best work is done with David's taking on Goliaths, and I know that about myself. And so I seek out opportunities to operate within that productive passion because it prevents me from falling into the lull of comfort of just working with people who can pay my bills. No, no, I refuse to allow comfort and fear to rob me of my productive passion. What is that for you? And what is that for your team? The third question you can ask is, what gives you hope? 
What is the thing that you believe and hold on to even in the face of resistance? Even when everybody around you says, oh, it's crazy. You're nuts, you're crazy. You know, fire and brimstone falling from the sky, cats and dogs living together, and you're like, I think it's going to be okay. It's going to be fine, right? What is that for you? What is the thing you believe that few people around you believe? Great clue to your productive passion. Once you begin to identify these dynamics, you can begin to define your battle lines. You cannot fight every battle, friends. You can't. You will lose. But you have to fight for something creatively. And the answer is going to be different for every person in this room. It is. Where are your battle lines? What is your productive passion? What are you willing to suffer on behalf of? Because the outcome matters more to you than your temporary comforts. The outcome matters more than any artificially escalated plank that fear is whispering about in your ear. What is that for you? One of my favorite thinkers is a guy named Thomas Merton, who was actually introduced to me by uh, Larry Bourgeois, who is one of my mentors, happens to be sitting here, uh, randomly sitting here in the audience today. Larry put a book in my hand several years ago called New Seeds of Contemplation by Thomas Merton. And in that book, Thomas Merton wrote about the dynamics of selling ourselves out. And he said this, there can be an intense egoism in following everyone else. People are in a hurry to magnify themselves by imitating what is popular and too lazy to think of anything better. Hurry ruins saints as well as artists. They want quick success and they're in such a hurry to get it, they cannot take time to be true to themselves. And when the madness is upon them, they argue that their very haste is a species of integrity. They want quick success and they're in such a hurry to get it, they cannot take time to be true to who? To themselves. And when the madness is upon them, when the marketplace is screaming at them, when their boss's boss's boss is saying, we need it yesterday, they justify selling out as a species of integrity. I had to do it. I had to do it. It was the most comfortable way for me to get external validation. I had to do it because fear was whispering in my ear, well, you better listen to what they say. They pay your mortgage. And in so doing, they compromise their body of work that will stand as a testament for all time about their season of breathing air on this speck of rock called earth. About 15 years ago, I was in a meeting and the person leading the meeting, it was about kind of a really dangerous or dangerous and risky thing we were doing. Uh, the person leading the meeting asked kind of an out of the blue question. He said, what do you think is the most valuable land in the world? I don't know, most valuable land in the world. So we start throwing out a bunch of guesses. Um, oil fields of the Middle East. Uh, gold mines of South Africa. Right? My colleague was from South Africa. Wrong. Uh, Manhattan. Okay. Wrong. So after throwing out a bunch of guesses, we said, well, what do you, you think is the most valuable land in the world? And my colleague, quoting the late Miles Monroe, said, I believe that the most valuable land in the world is the graveyard. Because in the graveyard are buried all of the unexecuted ideas, all of the unwritten novels, all of the unreconciled relationships, all of the ideas that people carried with them day after day after day. And they said, you know what? Tomorrow I'm going to get around to that. Tomorrow I'm going to start. Tomorrow's the day I'm actually going to push myself to get moving on this thing that is a splinter in my mind. And they pushed it and they pushed it and they pushed it into the future till one day they reached the bookend of their life and all of that value was buried with them dead in the ground, never to be seen by human eyes. That's why it's the most valuable land in the world because all of that value, the unrealized potential was buried with them. And that day I went back to my office and I wrote two words on an index card. And I put them on the wall of my office and I put them in my notebook. And those two words have defined the last 15 years of my life. And those two words were die empty. 
Because I want to know when I reach the bookend of my life, I'm not taking my best work to the grave. I'm not going to get to do everything. Of course not. None of us do. But I will know I have spent my days purposefully putting work into the world where it belongs, where it can be experienced by others. I've refused to monkeyize my Hendrix music just because it was uncomfortable or because I was afraid. The rough edges they decry you for now are the very rough edges they will celebrate you for later. I want to know that when they put me in the ground, my best work is out in the world where it belongs. Will you be able to say the same? Be purposeful, friends. Be diligent. Be brave. Confront the lull of comfort. Know who you are. Discover what you're willing to suffer on behalf of. And use that as your framework for making creative decisions. And if you're purposeful, and if you're diligent, And if you refuse to monkey eyes your Hendrix music, then someday in the far distant future when they put you in the ground, you can die empty of regret, but full of satisfaction for a life well lived. I think that's all any of us could ask for. Be brave. You've got this. You do. Thank you very much.